Troy, I can't hardly sing that song without smiling. I know that my Redeemer lives. What a beautiful song that is, and what a great, great song for us to sing tonight. We have a lot of things that go through our minds every day. I told you a lot about my son. He's 18, and I've never seen anybody that's hungry all the time more than him. If you've got a teenage son, you probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, Daniel, on the way home from school, he'll stop by Dairy Queen and get him something to eat. Then we'll get home about 5.30 and he'll be ready to eat supper. And then by 9 o'clock, he's hungry again. And so, you know, it's amazing how he's hungry all the time. And I couldn't imagine if I had two teenage boys. My daughter doesn't eat a whole lot. So I guess Daniel makes up for that and eats enough for all of us. But, you know, when we think about being hungry, we think about lacking something that we need. You know, I've, I've had times before when I said I was hungry, but I've never really been hungry. You know, because I've always had the ability to get something to eat pretty quickly when I felt like I needed it. And you have too. And we live in a country where we have a lot of privileges and a lot of opportunities to do that. But we've never really been hungry like we talk about folks who don't have food. I've been to Costa Rica a couple of times and I've seen people there. And I know when you go to Honduras, you see people there that are hungry. They don't have the ability to go out and get the food they need. And so, you know, many of them are really very, very hungry. I read about some places where people will have one meal a week. And I couldn't imagine living like that. And I can tell you that I've never really known what it's like to, to be real hungry. But in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talks in Matthew chapter 25. He begins that chapter, and what he starts with is the story of the... Uh, of the foolish virgins, the wise virgins and the foolish virgins, the ones that trimmed their lamps and the ones that didn't bring the stuff that they needed. And then he goes on and he talks about the talents. And when he gets down to verses 34 and 35, verses that, uh, that Clay read for us, I'd like for us to go on down to verse 36. And I want us to notice what happened here. Because Jesus had told them that he would tell them to, to, to come on into heaven, basically, because they had done what was needed. He said, I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a strength, and you took me in. Verse 36, the people say, naked, or Jesus continues, he says, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Jesus then says, Then shall the righteous answer unto him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? And he goes on and he's basically saying that they're going to be asking, When did these things happen? Why were we not aware of them? When did we do these things? And when we look at this, we know that it is significant for us to serve those people in the world. When we look at this, we, need, we understand that people who are in need, we need to serve. When we serve them, we are serving Christ. When we neglect to serve them, then we're neglecting to serve Christ. Notice there, he says, there's this word hungry. He talks about how that, let me just go ahead and put the verse up there for you. He says, the king said to them, come unto me. And he says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. You see, what happens is they're meeting the needs of the people who are in need. And when I think about that today, I think about a lot of things that our world needs. In fact, when you go home and watch the news tonight, if you do, if you watch 60 Minutes or something like that, it kind of scares you a little bit. And so I was thinking what the world really needs to be hungry for, and I thought of three simple things they need to be hungry for. And I want to share those with you tonight. The first one is the world needs to be hungry for the gospel. The world needs to know the message of Christ. The world needs to be taught that message. I think sometimes we don't realize, but if people are outside of Christ, they are lost. We try to rationalize in our minds, and we try to make it so that it's not that way. But the Bible teaches us over and over again that if people don't have Christ, if they're not Christians, then they're lost. And I'm going to tell you, our world today needs to know about Jesus. They need to know that he came and died for their sins and that there's a way for them to have a relationship with him so that they can have a home in heaven. And we think sometimes that people don't want to hear what we have to say. But I'm going to tell you something. They may not want to hear it, but they need to hear it. 
The world needs to hear the message of Jesus. They're starving for this life-saving message of the gospel of Jesus. John said in John chapter 6, verses 22 through 40, that it's the bread of life. Peter said it's the seed of rebirth in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Peter also said that it's the spiritual food whereby our souls can thrive in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. You see, the message we have, the Bible, the gospel, the world needs to hear it. And the church, individually and collectively, is the only hope for those starving souls to receive the food they so desperately need and they desire. Matthew chapter 14, in verse 19, the story of the feeding of the 5,000, there's a picture there of the work of the church given in the activity of the disciples. You see, Jesus was the source of the food. He gave it to the disciples who distributed it to the crowds. And Christ has given us the bread of life and the responsibility of seeing that it's distributed to the hungry. The message we have, we have an obligation. We have a responsibility. And it's up to us to share the message that we have. People in the world today are starving to receive the spiritual food that they need. And we have access to that, and we need to share that because people are hungry for the gospel. Can you imagine what a difference if people were taught the gospel and they obeyed the gospel it'd make in our world today? Could you imagine what a difference it would make in our country? It would change a lot of things in this country. It would change the way that we feel. But I want to tell you tonight that people are hungry for the gospel. The second thing I'd like to share with you is that people are hungry for a Christian example. In fact, when I think about that, this is one of the things that people really are looking for. They look for a picture. They look for a model. They look for an example. Somebody that they can be like. Today we call it a mentor a lot of times. Young businessmen find someone who's older. Even in other fields they do that. They find someone who's older, who's been successful. And they try to associate with them and learn from them. And they, they serve as a mentor. And what the world needs is a picture, a model, an example of how to reach heaven, of how to reach heaven. We've talked about the fact that we're there to tell them, but it's not enough just to tell them. I think a lot of times this is kind of where we have a disconnect. We will tell them what to do, but then when it comes to living it, we don't do quite as good a job as we do of telling them. It's important for us to set the proper example for them. The majority of people in the world are ignorant of who Jesus really is and what it means to be like him. Jesus taught us that we should be like the Father, but he also showed us what the Father was like. And I'm going to tell you, many people, you, to many people, you are the church. And when they look at your life, and they see how you live, they see what's important to you, you are an example of this church to them. And that's important for us to make sure that our talking and our walking match. That we are real, authentic, sincere Christians. That we're not just going through the motion, not just taking time to, to set aside a few hours a week, but that it's real. Because that's what the world needs. It's not enough to tell them how to be, but we've got to show them what it means to be a Christian. To be like Jesus. And it's the task of the church and each Christian to show the world what it's like. We realize how important it is for us to set a proper example at home. You know, probably some of you moms have punched dads for doing some things that they shouldn't have done in front of the children. <laughs> so you don't need to do that in front of the children. I know my wife punched me a few times. And we know it's important for us to set the proper example for our children. And we do everything we can to make sure that we set the right kind of example. 
But I'm going to tell you, it's just as important the kind of example we set in the world because when they look at us, they see the church of Christ. They see the church that Jesus died for. And it's important for us to reflect what we're supposed to reflect. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul wrote there to the church of Galatia. And in that verse, we sing that song often. I'm crucified with Christ, and nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what we need to be able to say. If we're going to set the proper example, notice Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. He says, I put the old man away. It's no longer there. He goes on and he says, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. When Christ lives in us, then we're going to be able to set the proper example for those that we come into contact with. When he lives in us, the world will be able to tell that he lives in us. And we need to make sure that we live for him. In the book of Acts, talking about some of the disciples there, it says in Acts chapter 4, they took notice of them that they had been with Jesus. Now that was quite a compliment when you think about it because they could tell they were Christians because they'd been with Jesus and the way that they were living. When the world looks at us, what do they see? Do they see people who are striving to live like Jesus? Or do they see people who are trying to to get ahead in this world and not taking any thought about what kind of example they're setting? So I want to tell you tonight, Henry County, Chester County, Paris, Henderson, Tennessee, Jackson, Tennessee, McKenzie, Tennessee, wherever you live, they are in need of people who will live a Christian life and set the right kind of example for those people that they come into contact with. And they're hungry for that. They're hungry for that Christian example. Then the third thing is, they're hungry for love and compassion. We live in a time where evil abounds. Where every day we see how evil people are in the world. And we are glad to throw stones at those people we see that are evil. There was a a missionary that had been in a small town in South Georgia. And he met a man there named Sam Tate. And he says, in the town... Mr. Tate was known for being the town drunk. One morning, the gentleman saw Mr. Tate, and Mr. Tate told him, he says, hey, the boys threw rocks at me last night. The preacher looked at him, he says, well, maybe they were trying to make a better man out of you, trying to help him to understand that maybe he needed to live better. Then the old drunk looked at him, and he says, I never heard of Jesus throwing rocks at anybody to make them better. And this is a good appraisal of the approach that many Christians take towards sinners and outsiders. The only way, the only way that sinners and outsiders can be saved is to come inside and to be forgiven. Us throwing rocks at them, us throwing stones at them is not going to help them to be saved. Now how do we react when people are sinners and they come in. People are hungry. Hungry for warmth, for concern, and for help. We must give them these things. We must show compassion. We must desire to help them. And we must love the sinner, even though we hate sin. How do we react when we see people who are sinning? We usually turn the cold shoulder. Maybe talk about them, condemn them, you know. But how did Jesus deal with sinners? John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, is a passage that we've talked about before. And in the book of John, Jesus here was loving, he was understanding, he was compassionate, he was merciful, but he was not condoning of her sin. 
He was forgiving. And he helped her to overcome the problem. And that's the way that we should deal with a, with a problem that people have in sin in the world today. In Jude, verse 23... Jude writes, and he says, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You know, Jude realized that we needed to reach out to those who were lost. We need to understand that people are hungry for love today. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 35, By this shall all men know you're my disciples. If you throw a lot of rocks, if you bicker and fight and fuss, if you criticize each other, no, by this shall all men know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. I think one of the things that we need to focus on in our service to others, and you do a good job of this, is to reach out to those who are lost and to care for them and to meet their needs. One of the things that I love about looking at the life of Jesus in the New Testament is when he came upon sinners, he usually met their needs and then he taught them. He usually took care of the needs they had and then he taught them the truth. I think a lot of times we want to teach them first and then try to take care of their needs after that. But it's hard for a person who's hungry to listen when they're hungry. We need to make sure that we treat others the way that Jesus did. When I think about our world today, I think about a world that's got a lot of problems. A lot of things going on that, that really scare us. But I'm going to tell you, I think about a world that's hungry for the gospel. They need to know Jesus. The world needs Jesus. I think about a world that's hungry for a Christian example. And there's not anyone in here tonight that could not set that Christian example. All of us could do that. Wherever we live, wherever we work, whatever we do, even our teenagers can do this. By setting a proper example to your friends at school and letting them know how important God is to you. And then the world is hungry for love. I look at this and I think these are things that we can do. These are things that all of us can do to get the message out to the world. We can share the gospel. We can live the right kind of life. And we can love the people that we come into contact with. There's so much hatred in the world. When we love, it stands out. See, the thing it takes is for us to decide to put Christ first in our lives. There's a lot of things that we have going on in our lives. And we're probably as busy or busier than we've ever been. When I was a teenager, I don't remember... My parents staying busy with me all the time like we have with our kids. And maybe we're, my generation is a, is a lot more involved. Maybe we've got more time. I don't know what it is. But whether it's travel basketball or travel baseball or whether it's uh, church camp or a youth group trip or whatever, we always find time to do that. And we stay so busy. But I'm going to tell you, we need to find time. <laughs> To show the love of Christ in our lives. Our young people watch us. They pay attention to us. And they may listen to me preach. They may listen to Adam preach. They may listen to Corey preach. But the lesson you teach them at home by the way you live teaches them a whole lot more. And so I want to challenge you tonight. Whether you're a parent, a grandparent youth minister, aunt, uncle, brother, sister, whatever, put Christ first. The world is hungry to know about Christ, and if we don't share that message, nobody will. 
I want to ask you to look at your life tonight and see if you're doing that. See if you're sharing that message. See if you're setting the right kind of example. See if you're showing the right kind of love. And if you're not, it might be that you need to come and ask the church to pray for you. Could be you just need to ask God to forgive you. It could be tonight that you're here and you're not a Christian and you're ready to put Christ on in baptism to begin your life to do these things. I want to encourage you tonight. Don't leave the building with your life not right with God. If it's a private prayer you need to say, do it. But if you need to come, respond before the church. Won't you do that as we stand and as we sing?